Good evening, everyone. I think we are, I am, like, inordinately blessed to have Chen Chomes in the world. On the car ride down here, as we were talking, I think the verb I used was oxygenate. I think his book oxygenates American poetry. The blood needs to circulate in the body, right? And it goes back into the heart, it goes through the lungs, and, and it, gets, it gets life. I think his poems do that. I think uh, his poems are a testament to the way in which language is provocation and promise and play and possibility. Um, I'm so happy this room is packed because he deserves that. Um, Chen Chen. So I'm going to mostly read from the book and maybe a couple new ones. Um, Ready to go. Okay. Self portrait with and without. With dried cranberries, without a driver's license, with my mother's mother's worry, without till recently my father's glasses, with an A in English, a C in chemistry, with my mother saying, You have to be three times better than the white kids at everything, without a dog or cat, with a fish, with a fish I talked to before bed telling him my ideas for new kinds of candy, with a tutor in Mandarin, with a 1986 low-budget live-action TV version of Journey to the West, with Monkey King's quest for redemption, Buddhism through Monster of the Week battle sequences, with thinking, I've grown up now because I regularly check the news in the morning, with the morning the children, spared or missed by the child with a gun, go back to school, make the same jokes they made three Mondays ago, but in a different voice. With a younger brother who is taller than I am, with the youngest brother who wants to go to art school, with my mother's multiplying worries, with my brothers, my brothers, with the cry of bats, with the salt of circumstance, without citizenship, with the white boy in ninth grade who called me ugly, without my father for a year because he had to move away to the one job he could find on the other side of the state, with his money transferred to my mother, with William Carlos Williams, with the local library, with yet another bake sale for Honduras in Massachusetts suburbia, with the earthquake in my other country, with my mother's long distance calls, with my aunt's calls from China when the towers fell. How far are you from New York? How far are you from New York? With cities fueled by scars, with the footprint of a star, with the white boy I liked, with him calling me ugly, with my knees on the floor, with my hands begging for straighter teeth, lighter skin, blue eyes, green eyes, any eyes brighter other than mine. There's like that one. Um, thank you. Okay. Elegy. My shoes were growing more powerful with each day. I walked in the country of letters, its fields of eyes belonging to my lost sister, dark eyes that early closed or forgot to open. I have not been back in some time, though often I walk to my office, daydreaming of that country's fashions, the clothes of its citizens like the clothes of my dearest dead or unborn. In the heaven of letters, I will not walk. I will not strip the golden clothes from my lover, the wheat. I will stand, stay with the trees before me, their ancient charisma that cares for me. Like all scholars in any sort of heaven, I will study the metaphysics of madness. I will find that the littler the light, the better it tastes. On earth lately, I've been looking at everyone like I love them, and maybe I do. Or maybe I only love one person, and I'm beaming from it. Or actually, I just love myself, and I want people to know. It seems the dead are busy with work we cannot comprehend. And like parents, they don't want to tell you what their jobs really consist of, how much they make. They don't want to scare you, the dead, with what's left of their ankles, with their new secret wishes. I don't really have like an anecdote for that one. 
maybe one will come to me. Yes. Um, this is called The Cuckoo Cry. Lost the milk, spilled my marbles. Our thoughts are fragile, says the Russian prof. And I try to gather, whole tender, both spilled and lost, my ugly diptych of spring. Every spring, my windows open and ugly happens. I try to hold it together, though maybe should let it go. Gush, let spring bark and heat rain from pit-stained clouds. Let the lark know the cuckoo cry. Let spring say the truth. I called my mother a bitch, said everyone in the neighborhood knew. She had almost struck down my door, asking who was on the phone, who she had struck me, called me names, forbidden me from talking, who on the phone, some boy, wasn't it, sick boy, spreading his sick, musky spring, American spring, beastly goo of wrong wanting. Spring says, I told my mother she was living in a dream, could never go back to the way things were. And she said, not even here, I can't say what I feel here. The one place I have in this stupid country, I can't just be, rest, I have to fight, even at home. Spring says, it doesn't want to be personified, wants to be forgotten, doesn't want to be trigger for memory. Spring says it and fall are retracting their contractual smells and birds, their unlimited catalog of liminal spaces. Fall says, stop naming children after me. I say people name their kids Autumn, not Fall. Um, okay, so I, don't, I feel like I should read this one. I was in Syracuse last night and didn't read this one, but it's like, upstate New York. Um, if you've been to the, the zoo, the Syracuse Zoo. Um, this is called To the Guanacos at the Syracuse Zoo. They're so beautiful. Okay. I'm sorry I would have skipped past your exhibit on my quest for the elephants, if not for my boyfriend's shouting, look, llamas. I'm sorry I then called out, llamas, twice, three times. In the typical zoo attendees, I love you, shriek, before noticing your sign. Not llamas, but their close relatives, guanacos. I'm sorry my boyfriend kept calling you guacamoles. <laughs> and I'm sorry I found that funny. I'm sorry, guanacos, for all four of you on display. Your little slice of Syracuse Hill looked nothing like the lush Patagonian plains or grand Atacama desert lands pictured in your bio. I'm sorry you were not llama famous and stuck in an underfunded zoo in upstate New York. After reading more of your bio, I'm sorry your lives in the wild weren't so grand either. Your more hospitable habitats were being destroyed. You were hunted by fox, puma, mountain lion, and man, inventive man who used, I'm sorry, your thick neck skin to make shoes. I'm sorry that even though it was a stupid hot day, you could not demonstrate your most adorable survival technique, licking the dew off cacti, as there were no cacti around. And yet it's true, I watched you. And I'm sorry for staring as I did, it's just that you somehow managed to look at once elegant and weary. I mean, each of you sitting so still with your legs tucked beneath your body and then your sleepy eyes. I mean, the four of you were like a quartet of elderly duchesses. I'm sorry, later I looked you up on the zoo website and found out you were all males. <laughs> I'm sorry, I meant for this to be an ode, a love letter, and it is, I swear, but the ways you've been treated, I knew I couldn't, on top of all that, lie to you. I didn't intend to meet you, and you yourselves were probably hoping for better. But isn't this how it happens? Aren't all great love stories, at their core, great mistakes? Um, okay, this is called Poem. That's what it is. Wracked by doubt, but not yet wrecked by it, I pray to the microwave, the crisper drawer, the lemony dish soap, please fish me out of this funk so I can stop puttering around the kitchen, scarfing fries, chips, every man-made form of potato, including mashed, even stuffed doubled over by dour, but not yet doomed to it. I mope with some hope 
desperately open to the dinkiest sign, trace of sensation, confession. I have succumbed to the starch. I have worn the same band tee four days in a row, no one outside the apartment to see. And here you might plead, but wait, and beg, but what about your lover, your recent career luck? And I'd reply, don't you know I hate the words career and lover? I thought you were my best friend, but you're just a paperback copy of Madame Bovary. I haven't been able to finish. I've been putting off her suicide for weeks now. It's unbearable to know how someone will die, even a made-up someone who does unlikable things. It's awful knowing how and when and a large portion of why. And really, boyfriend isn't much better. It sounds like we're still preparing for junior prom when we live together. And his mother has no white blood cells because the chemo that's killing the cancer is also killing her. And I should be praying for her, and sometimes I do, but mostly it's for me. The least I could do is not droop and wilt like a bad houseplant. It doesn't give people any strength, this sad, endlessly selfish syntax, though maybe it's getting better. I used to think I knew how I would die, all tragic like Emma Bovary, but without all the adultery and carriages, and probably not in provincial France. And not, not that I now believe it's selfish to kill yourself, I don't know, don't want to know how anyone will die or when, though I generally like to know why. Our lives, pathetically brief, compared to the bowhead whale, the baobab tree, perhaps partner is close to what I mean, but it sounds so unsexy. I like to sound sexy again and strong. Last week when his mother had a break from chemo, she went beeline to the grocery, craving the most unhospital of ingredients, hungering to make some real thing and hot, but she couldn't touch anything which would get her sick, which was potentially everything. No, I don't want anyone to die, except Cheney and racist cops and certain Wall Street bastards and the guy who called me a fag and laughed, but they will die, and you and I don't want to know how the book ends, that the book ends. I should pick up the phone and call my mother, ask her about her little vegetable patch out back if she's planted any more eggplants. Okay, this is called Nature Poem. There's nature in it. The birds insist on pecking the wooded dark. The wooded dark pecks back. It is time to show the universe what you are capable of, says my horoscope, increasingly insistent this month. But what I'm capable of is staring at the salt accident on the coffee table and thinking, what sad salt. I admire my horoscope for its conviction. I envy its consistency. Every day, every day, there is a future to be aggressively vaguer about. <laughs> Earlier today, outside the cabin, the sudden deer were a supreme headache of beauty. Don't they know I'm trying to be, at, to be alone and at peace? In theory, I am alone, and really, I'm hidden, which is a fine temporary substitute for peace, except I still have email, which is how I receive my horoscope. And even here, in the wooded dark, I receive yet another email mistaking me for another Chen. I add this to a folder, which also includes emails sent to my address, but addressed to Chang, Chin, Chung. Once in a Starbucks, the cashier was convinced I was Chad. <laughs> Once in a Starbucks, the cashier did not quite finish the N on my Chen, and when my tall mocha was ready, they called out for share. <laughs> I preferred this by far, but began to think the problem was Starbucks. Why can't you see me? Why can't I stop needing you to see me? For someone who looks like you to look at me, even as the coffee accident is happening to my second favorite shirt. In my wooded dark, I try insisting on a supremely tall, never lonely someone. But every kind of someone needs someone else to insist with. I need. If not the you, I have memorized and recited and mistaken for the universe. Another you. Um, this is called chapter eight of, of what? Um, but I was like, maybe this is like a novel that I can't write. Okay, chapter eight. Autumn was an argument about hair and how much of it. Too much, not enough, just right, but just for now. And then it was winter. The licorice of every season was rather inappropriate. Well, OK, how about this? And you put on more of my deodorant. What can one do but put on more deodorant? Paris, lopsided, was still Paris. 
a congregation, a conflagration, a smiling conundrum in the form of a ladder it takes years to climb down. In our last ever Scrabble game, you changed my whore into horde. I tried to ask my parents to leave the room, but not my life. It was very hard, because the room was the size of my life, because my life was small, and wanted to eat candy corn instead of confrontation. Raising one's voice in a small space felt at once godlike and childish. You agreed with me out of a practical concern, and I loved you for it. We were two horses in search of the least abandoned constellation. But the night sky was overtaken by the beatitude of the ultimate horse. Also, Ben had upset West with his choice of neckties, but then the author decided it would all be better in second person, actually. When did I first realize my parents were not infinite, but I could see the end of them, past their capes and catchphrases? One day in fourth grade, my teacher said, you're lucky to be so young. You'll heal up from that bicycle accident in no time, no scars. No time, no scars. Sing it with me, loud as Reykjavik summer, easy as my etch-a-sketch when I made a mistake. I will try my best not to mistake you for my parents. I mean my problems with my parents. I mean me. Believe with me another melody, that the room, the life, could go by a different light, and we could say hello, meaning gentleness with all our might. I'll read one more from here. Self-portrait as so much potential. Dreaming of one day being as fearless as a mango, as friendly as a tomato, merciless to chin and shirt front. Realizing I hate the word sip, but that's all I do. I drink so slowly and say I'm tasting it when I'm just bad at taking in liquid. I'm no mango or tomato. I'm a rusty yawn in a rumored year. I'm an Arctic attic. Come amble in ampersand in the slippery polar clutter. I am not the heterosexual neat freak my mother raised me to be. I am a gay sipper. And my mother has placed what's left of her hope on my brothers. She wants them to gulp up the world, spit out solid degrees, responsible grandchildren ready to gobble. They will be better than mangoes, my brothers, though I have trouble imagining what that could be. Flying mangoes, perhaps. <laughs> Flying mango-tomato hybrids. Beautiful sons. Um, so I'll read a little bit this new Thing. Um, yeah, this is very new. This is called Summer. Your emergency contact has experienced an emergency. The Texas sun shines hard in everything like a detective. You hide out eating soup from microwavable cans. Sometimes you're studying abroad and ask the kitchen table where to find the closest subway station. Sometimes the kitchen table replies by the family of cockroaches in the bathroom. Other times, language is the last thing you should learn more of. The cockroach family nods. The Texas sky changes color like a giant PowerPoint, very proud of itself. You feel like a cockroach, except you know how to use the microwave. Sometimes every living thing just sounds like Please. Other times, please don't. Please no. The mother cockroach says, in the event of a sudden loss of cabin meaning, backup meanings will drop from the overhead compartment. The Texas moon shines like a too obvious clue. Please grab hold of a meaning and pull it to your face. Your kitchen table shines back, an unsolvable station, Please hold, pull close. It is sudden cabin of loss. You are a sound you haven't yet learned. And I'll close with this poem. It's very different. Um, the School of Night in hyphens. Night like, you know, nighttime, not like horse. Okay. The School of Night in hyphens. 
The sky tonight, so without aliens. The woods, very lacking in witches. But the people, as usual, replete with people. And so you, with your headset, sit in the home office across the hall, stuck in a hell of strangers crying, computers dying, the new fathers dropped in toilet baby photos, the old Canadian, her grandson Gregory, all grown up now Greg, who gave her this phone but won't call her. You call her wonderful. You encourage her to tell you what's wrong with her device. You with your good at your job, good lookingness. I bet even over the phone it's visible. I bet all the Canadian grandmas want you. But hey, you're with me. Hey, take off that headset. Steal away from your post. Cross the hall. You sings the chorus too soon. You makes a killer veggie taco. You played tennis in college build. You Jeffrey, you Jeff ship full of stars, cauldron full of you. Come teach me a little bit of nothing in the dark, abundant powers. Okay. Thank you so much.